All righty. Well, hello, everyone. Thank you for uh, tuning in to another episode of Red Hill Rediscovered. Uh, my name is Cody Youngblood, and I am the Director of Historic Preservation and Collections here at Patrick Henry's Red Hill. And I'm so glad to introduce uh, today's two speakers, Dr. Alexi uh, Garrett and Mr. Tom Hand. Hello. Now, um, Dr. Alexi Garrett is going to be our moderator today discussing um, Mr. Hand's new book, uh, Dr. Garrett is an assistant professor of early American history at St. Michael's College in Vermont. She earned her MA and PhD from the University of Virginia, and she's currently turning her dissertation into a manuscript, which focuses on the intersection of gender, slave ownership, and manufacturing in post-revolutionary Virginia. Her research has been generously supported by Patrick Henry's Red Hill, Monticello, Mount Vernon, and the Harvard Business School, among others. Now, Tom Han graduated from West Point and went on to create the Gilman Cheese Corporation after leaving the military. Now retired, Tom serves on the Board of Trustees for the American Battlefield Trust and is the creator and director of Americana Corner. Mr. Han created Americana Corner in 2020 to share informative stories of the momentous events, significant documents, and influential leaders that helped shape our country. Through compelling articles and captivating videos, Mr. Han hopes to rekindle a spirit of patriotism in his fellow Americans and remind them of our nation's incredible past and why our founding era still matters today. So without further ado, I will uh, leave it off to Dr. Garrett and Mr. Han. And uh, as the presentation continues, please feel free on whichever platform you're tuning into to leave a comment and we'll leave room to answer those comments and questions at the end. Okay. Thanks, Cody. Appreciate it. Hey, Alexa, yeah. how are you? I'm doing well, Tom. How are you? I believe yeah. you wanted to start with some slides, yes? I would love to hear what you have to say about this great new book. Well, um, thank you. Yeah, uh, I guess I um, wanted to uh, start off talking about, uh, first thanking Red Hill for let, letting me talk today. Um, but more than that, I want to uh, tell a little bit about Americana Corner, if that's okay. Of course. Let's start Let's there. Plug. So... <laughs> Americana Corner is uh, a website that I created along with Sherry Breen from Left Brain Right um, that tells stories each week. Every Tuesday, we post an 800 word story. And every Friday, we post a corresponding two and a half minute video. And we tell stories uh, on, on our founding era mostly. And we hope to work all our way through, all the way uh, to America's first century. Um, the stories we find are compelling. We think that they, uh, they tell a nice story and the, and the Friday video kind of builds on what we talk about on Tuesday. Um, I started Americana Corner, uh, primarily because I wanted to remind my fellow Americans on a nation's incredible past. And, uh, and also Alexi to remind them about how truly inspirational it is. Mm -hmm. And, um, I'm a little concerned we're starting to lose sight of that. And so I created Americana Corner. Um, but I felt like it could do even more. And so we created this thing called Preserving America Grants. Oh, there, thank you, thank you. Um, the Preserving America Grant Program is designed to help other early American history organizations like Red Hill tell their part of the great American story. Um, uh, we've been blessed with some financial resources who are uh, the sale of our cheese business. And I felt like if I put that money in the hands of people on site, the boots on the ground, we could do even more with our money. And so that's what we do with this. To date, we've given out, uh, oh, there you go. Thank you. 200 plus projects. I won't read the, the, the slide to everyone. <laughs> and uh, in about five weeks, we will be announcing our next batch of grant recipients. Um, great projects out there, including probably one for Red Hill, but I'm not supposed to comment on that at this point. <laughs> but uh, but anyway, it, it's been great. Every February, every Washington's birthday, I get to play Santa Claus, yeah. give out money to these organizations. And then beyond that, uh, Alexi, we track them during the year. We get progress reports, we stay involved to some degree, and then we see a conclusion report at the end of the project. And it makes us feel like we're building a relationship with these organizations. And so it's just it's just been a great blessing. And then from there, we moved into the book. And you know, the book was one of these kind of things, uh, Alexi, that 
I've always wanted to do, but, um, and I read a ton. I'm sure you do too. <laughs> so many books, Alexia, are written for other writers, academicians, um, research people, all great people. They need their books, but not many people write histories for the average man, for the everyday American. And so I wrote The American Triumph with an eye towards them, the waitress, the, the road construction guy, the, the, I don't know, the factory worker who wants to know a little bit about their nation's history, but doesn't want to spend three weeks reading a 500 page book. And even on Patrick Henry, great, great guy, great American, but a lot of people won't pick up that book. But in my book, you get a little bit of these guys enough to know your nation's history without having to spend weeks and months researching it. Um, and to me, a book has to be entertaining. You know, it, it, you're taking time away from other things. It's got to be entertaining. And so we made this with 130 uh, full color historic images, beautiful images, a dozen maps that we had created. Um, and so I know I'm biased. But I really consider this a, a visual masterpiece. Uh, I hope the writing is good because it's all mine. Yeah. But uh, I think that, uh, and we priced it right. We took the book to a couple publishing houses. They wanted to do it, but they wanted it priced at about 70 bucks a book. And we said, mm -hmm. it's too expensive. Mm -hmm. We wanted to edit my work. Can you imagine that editing my work? I said, no <laughs> way. <laughs> oh, <laughs> no. Yeah. So we formed Americana Corner Press. And uh, we printed it. We did everything ourselves. Well, Sherry did most of the work, to be honest. But uh, and so it's a high quality book at a at a moderate price that we think will resonate well with uh, everyday Americans. And so that's that's my story. That's your story. We're just getting started. This is wonderful. Thank you so much, Tom. Thank you. Sure. Uh, yeah. So just to start, I did want to kind of show our audience what the book looks like. It is beautiful. It is gorgeous. I have it right here. Hey, there you go. Yeah, it's a hard copy. It's about that big. And the color printing in it is absolutely gorgeous. Oh, thank uh, you. People can see some of this and it's just organized really well uh, as well. So we have um, lots of just lots of information in this book, uh, but in a good way that has a good chronology to it and a good overview of some really interesting um, early American events and our founders. So. Again, the book is called An American Triumph, America's Founding Era Through the Lives of Ben Franklin, George Washington, and John Adams. Okay, so I've had the pleasure of reading it. It gives a great overview of our many nations' um, early events, especially kind of leading to the American Revolution, the revolution itself, and then the first decades of our new republic when these men who really disagreed with each other <laughs> had to create some founding documents for a brand new nation they called the United States. Um, so, but you don't stop there. You don't even stop with the Constitution or anything like that. You go even into the Jay Treaty, the Whiskey Rebellion. You even give George Washington's famous farewell address, right? Oh, beautiful it's, address. Yes. It's beautiful. And you finally, in this book, reflect on the men's legacies in the United States today. So my first question for you, uh -huh. this is probably a softball question for you. We like those. Have, That's okay. I have to ask you, right? <laughs> Okay, you chose to focus on three of America's so-called founding fathers. We have yeah. Ben Franklin, whom you and others have called the first American. Yeah. We have George Washington, who was the country's first president, yeah. of course, and John Adams, the country's first vice president and second president. All of these men were those things, but yeah. there were so much more, as you show in your book. So that is a long-winded way of asking. My first question for you is, why Ben? Why George and why John? Why these three men in particular out of the many other founding fathers that you could have highlighted? What yeah, a, draws you to these three people? You know, that's a, a great question. And, and it's, uh, it, it takes me to the, the, the core uh, tenant of this book, the core focus of the book, and that's service to country. Okay, and, tell us uh, more. Yeah, and, and um, I wanted to write a book about that about how uh, uh, Americans focused on uh, furthering the country's ends, perhaps sometimes to their own disadvantage or personal disadvantage. Mm -hmm. And um, through reading all the different biographies I've read, I found Franklin, Washington, and Adams 
to best uh, the best examples of service to country, and, and each interestingly in their own way. Uh, I found Franklin's service to country largely through civic improvements for his fellow man, his fellow Americans, everything from the bifocals to uh, the Franklin stove, to setting up the first hospital in Philadelphia, the first uh, fire brigade, the, uh, he invented the, the lightning rod and, and all the other things that, that he did. And he always did it with an eye towards his fellow man. He didn't patent anything because he felt uh, America and society at large would benefit more if it wasn't patented. Uh, and, and so he was civic minded beyond measure and, and more so than anyone else that I've read about. Okay. Uh, George Washington, of course, is the indispensable man. And <laughs> I, you, you can talk all day about George Washington, never tired of what he did for mm -hmm. his country. Mm -hmm. um, you know, to spend eight years uh, as a commander in chief, uh, eight years as our nation's first president, um, uh, resigning power twice. Mm -hmm. Uh, in, in my book, one of the chapters is entitled Washington's Finest Hour, and it's not crossing the Delaware, which to me was a pivotal moment in the revolution, but it was surrendering power. Mm -hmm. And then for an encore performance, he did it in uh, 1797 uh, uh, when he mm -hmm. surrendered power to uh, John Adams. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, we go, oh, OK, that's great. Well, it didn't happen back then. And yep. So you can't judge it by the context of what happens today. Of course, you know, uh, but back then, the guy went into power, stayed in power until he died. Mm -hmm. In many cases, it became a hereditary thing. George Washington didn't, he's, he's the reason that didn't, doesn't happen here. And John Adams, uh, probably my favorite founding father. I love George okay. Washington, but I love John Adams. Um, Supreme Patriot is one of my chapters. I talk about what he did for this country. Mm -hmm. uh, service to country, he, uh, he, he was... Uh, not diplomatic, but he agreed to be a diplomat for 10 years. He almost worked himself to death at the mm -hmm. Second Continental Congress. Mm -hmm. You know, Alexi, he was on 90 committees, 90, and he chaired 25 of them. No one else did that. And oh, he declared the first man in the House. He was. He He's the one that nominated George Washington, put him on the world stage. Mm -hmm. He allowed Thomas Jefferson to write the Declaration of Independence even though Adams was a prolific writer uh, and would have done a fine job. And he knew that whoever wrote this was going to go, and go down in posterity's eyes as a great founding father. Yet he mm -hmm. gave up that opportunity to give it to Thomas Jefferson, even though he was being asked to write it. Right. Uh, country ahead of self. And, uh, and then, you know, he's, he's the only person who stayed in Washington's cabinet he wasn't a cabinet member, I guess, but his administration for eight, eight years, the only one. Jefferson left early. Hamilton left early. Knox did. Randolph did. Mm -hmm. Adams up by him, maybe with an eye to the presidency. Maybe that's true. Mm -hmm. But still, uh, and so every one of these guys devoted their life to helping uh, the United States of America. And so it's a long answer to your first question. But uh, anyway, I'm on my soapbox. I'll get off now. No, this is for you. The, we love the soapbox. Thank you. No, that's a wonderful answer. I love all that. Does that make sense <laughs> to you or not? Yes, that sounds wonderful. Okay, so thank you so much. My next question is a little bit more um, on the writing side of this book. So if you don't mind, take uh -huh. us through the creation of this book, start to finish, right? I bet our audience would like to know, you know, where exactly did you get the idea? What did research look like for you? How long did this process take? How did you decide to structure it the way you did? And maybe you can tell our audience who may not have read it yet, like how exactly it's structured. And what was the writing process like for you? Well, yeah, that's, um, I don't want to bore people with too many details, but um, I, first of all, it's a labor of love. And so it, it wasn't it wasn't work. It, you know, oh. it, well, it wasn't. It's tons of fun. That's amazing. <laughs> so, um, and, and the creative, uh, I, I don't know. All I know is that things come to me, mm -hmm. the ideas, and, and, I, and I put them down on paper. And, you know, mm -hmm. some things resonate, some things don't. Mm -hmm. um, and so I, I can't speak too much of that, except that the things they put in this book made sense in, in my mind. Um, the, the, the writings had to be couched in in in, uh, in a way that the everyday American would say, you know what, I don't need a dictionary sitting right next to me. 
Mm -hmm. Reading this book, you know, Lexi, mm -hmm. some books you read like that, and you know, I, I went into a dictionary, and I have a pretty broad vocabulary. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. And so the writing style was written so if if, if my brother picked it up, mm -hmm. it was not a history buff. He said, you know what? Yeah, I can read this and not fall asleep reading it. Yeah. And so the structure of the book is it's eight hundred words, nine hundred words per per store per chapter. It's easy places to end a night's reading if you want to read it next to your uh, bedside. Mm -hmm. um, there are tons of pictures in there, pictures that me and, and, and Sherry picked out, mostly Sherry, uh, that uh, are in there. We have a, a great layout team. Uh, mm -hmm. like, like any great enterprise, it takes a team. It takes, mm -hmm. you know, it takes a community. We had a great layout guy who came up with a banner idea. Uh, you know, mm -hmm. We had a, a, another gal who did the editing. Um, and so we came up with a manuscript. I'll, I'll just digress just a bit and talk about Please. the book printed. Please. You know, it's interesting. Uh, I wrote it for the Everyday American, but if it was priced so that that waitress couldn't buy it, well, then what's the point? And so we took the book to some publishing houses. Uh, a couple of them wanted to do it. Uh, they said, you know, we'll, we'll do it, but we want to uh, sell it for 70 bucks. Well, no way. No, thank you. Mm -hmm. So Sherry and her team uh, came up with, uh, they found a printer in California. It had to be printed in America. Mm -hmm. so we could have printed it much cheaper overseas, but we printed mm -hmm. it here in America. Um, she found a layout person. She found a cover design person, all these things. And so that, that background team that you don't see on camera put it all together for me. And so we created a printing company called Americana Corner Press. Okay. Uh, and um, we're going to put all our books out under that brand, that uh, that LLC, so that the book can continue to be beautiful, a visual masterpiece, and affordable for the everyday mm -hmm. American. And so um, I don't know if that answers your question, but that's that's how we did it. And um, you know, I spend my I spend my evenings reading uh, um, history books. Uh, now I will digress a little bit and read Charles Dickens every once in a while. I like him. <laughs> But uh, but so I thought, why not put this on paper and see if people want to read it? And mm -hmm. and it seems like some of them do. That's wonderful. And I think your mission to have it printed in the United States fits well with the theme of the book and just kind of the entrepreneurial spirit that you have behind even getting this out there, I think matches maybe some of the founders you even wrote about. So <laughs> I really, I love that. I love how those layers uh, meet. So yeah, thank you. So I appreciate yeah, it. Yeah, that's great. Okay. So, well, you can't be surprised when I'm asking you the next question, okay? Since we are hosted by the wonderful Red Hill organization, you yes. know I've got to ask, do you yes. consider Patrick Henry a founding father? And if you are going to include more about him, you do, you do write about Patrick, but if you're going to maybe, you know, do this book again, what would your readers learn maybe about Patrick Henry? What are your thoughts on Patrick Henry? It's okay. Well, we're, we're a brave audience here. You're yeah, really you know, for the first qu answer to your question, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, great founding father. Uh, the book could only handle so many yeah. people in the book, and uh, and and he he didn't make the top three. I will say that. Mm -hmm. uh, great founding father. Um, uh, he was probably the most eloquent uh, speaker on the, on the founding uh, father uh, movement that, that, mm -hmm. that generation. Um, I wish I could have heard him speak. Uh, yeah. People, what people said about him was just he was riveting. Apparently. Mm -hmm. um, he, uh, you know, he was de declaring against the Stamp Act and calling uh, King George III on the, under the carpet. Uh, <laughs> four other people were doing that. Mm -hmm. uh, it took a lot of courage to do that. Uh, he was a uh, he was a brave man. He uh, he was incredibly incredibly principled. Um, uh, he didn't always do the easier thing. He was opposed to the Constitution. If you remember. Mm -hmm. um, not a popular stance. No, uh, he could have been one of the guys there. He could have been one of the leading players. He, I'm sure, he recognized that he was a, a brilliant man. Mm -hmm. But his principles wouldn't allow him to uh, give that much power to a, a central authority. And uh, jeepers, you have to admire somebody who has that kind of principle. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, John Adams uh, was that sort of principled man as well when he defended the soldiers in the Boston Massacre. Yes. I mean the most prosperous attorney in, in Boston, a lot to lose, nothing to gain. Taking on this public case, he takes it on. 
masterfully wins it. Patrick Henry was one of those kind of principled men. Um, uh, and so, and so yeah, great founding father, didn't make it into the top three, uh, <laughs> but he's, he's one of those kind of guys that, um, that just doesn't get enough notice. You know, these three guys couldn't have done it on their own. It, it, it took a Patrick Henry, George Mason, another great Virginian, there's mm -hmm. almost no talk. I, yeah. Have you seen George Mason's monument on the Tidal Basin in Washington? No. What's it look like? Like a closet. Ah. Hardly anything. It's terrible. <laughs> and and, oh. and uh, the guy who used most of his writings, Thomas yeah. Jefferson, Great America, yeah. right. uh, gets the huge monument. And so mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Patrick Kennedy is one of those great uh, guys. Um, he was a uh, governor of Virginia. Uh, he uh, was very supportive, very supportive of George Rogers Clark's mission to capture the, uh, the southwest portion of the province of Quebec, which mm. led to the Northwest Territory becoming ours uh, without mm. support from Patrick Henry. That wouldn't have happened. And mm. it's possible that when the Treaty of Paris was signed, that that land north of the Ohio was still in British hands because Clark never gets permission to take that land. Mm -hmm. And uh, and our borders end at the Ohio River. It's just um, mm -hmm. it's, yeah, great, a great American, great patriot. Didn't make the didn't make the book. Okay, not everyone can make the book. That's okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, we here at Red Hill love Patrick Henry as well for the for very many of the same reasons. So don't worry, he gets definitely featured in the book for the audience who stands. <laughs> don't worry. <laughs> Wonderful, thank you. Okay, well, I'd like to now just ask: Are there any fun anecdotes that you can share about your research process or maybe even just thinking about what kind of personalities did these three guys have? Like what is a story maybe you could share from when you were doing your research that really kind of captured, well, that's George Washington, right? Or maybe, oh, that's so John Adams <laughs> or that's so Franklin. Like, can you think of just some interesting little vignettes or anecdotes about these three men that you can share with our audience? Well, I'd have to say Ben Franklin is the easiest one to find anecdotes about. That is the most interesting person I've read, ever read about in my life. This guy from wearing coonskin caps <laughs> in the court of uh, King Louis yeah. to, to running away at age 17 to, uh, you know, running, to, to writing articles under a pseudonym called Silence Do Good <laughs> um, and slipping them under his brother's newspaper door so we can get them published because his brother, brother wouldn't publish them. He's like, he's like a life of anecdotes, but uh, you know, one of them that uh, shows Franklin's uh, you know, scientific bent, I guess, is when he was flying his kite. He wanted to uh, see the power of electricity. He knew that was generated heat, obviously. Mm -hmm. And he flew a kite, took a wire from the kite, plugged it into a turkey mm -hmm. and, and fried up some turkeys <laughs> with electricity and with, with lightning. Yeah. And uh, had the wit to declare it uh, uncommonly tender. Ah. And so um, anyway, but and so but Ben Franklin was, it was fun to read about him. Uh, he was a diplomat. Uh, he probably was, uh, he probably wouldn't have accomplished the Treaty of Paris terms that John Adams got. And John Adams, you know, he was more of a the fighter. And, uh, and so, you know, the John Adams, we already talked about my favorite John Adams thing, and that's the, uh, the Boston Massacre thing. Mm -hmm. um, what a man of principle. Uh, everything to lose, nothing to gain. Mm -hmm. Does it anyway. And uh, yeah, those guys don't come along that often. So that's my favorite um, you know, John Adams story. And it's not a fun anecdote, but it's as long as you say, you know what, this is a good man. Mm -hmm. um, and with George Washington, um, you know, the, the thing about George Washington at age 21 uh, started the French and Indian War, sort of. I mean, he's done. Yeah. And, uh, and his life, you know, I believe in divine providence. I won't get into too much into that, but I believe that the good Lord has a hand in what we're doing down here. And, mm. and if you read George Washington's life, you'll see so many instances where he was the right guy at the right time and never received a wound ever I yeah. mean, at the battle of monongahela he uh um, it was a disaster obviously for braddock uh washington has four bullet holes in his vest two horses shot out from under him doesn't get a scratch uh mm -hmm. 
he hmm. uh, regard rear guard Norigas hit. He's he's at Princeton. He's thirty yards away from a full line of British muskets, all firing at him on a big white horse. Doesn't get a scratch. Hmm. Right guy at the right time. He's protected mm -hmm. his whole life by something. Um, mm -hmm. And and so the anecdote I just say about George Washington is uh, it, it's it's amazing as you read his life story about how many times he came in harm's way, and he was preserved for us. Anyway, that's my opinion. Anyway. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. No, mm -hmm. I like that. I like that. Um, yeah, I was also th I like this idea of he he was in the right place at the right time, or maybe he had some sort of protection or something like that. I'm I'm thinking he sure was in the right place at the right time to marry uh, the richest widow in Virginia. Yeah, you know, uh, that, was, that was good timing on his part. That's okay. You know? George Washington traded up. There's nothing wrong with that. Yes, he I did. I mean, he recognized oh, it. And hey, he right. traded way up, and I think Martha liked a man in uniform. So there's nothing wrong with that. <laughs> she was a great gal. You know, it's interesting. She doesn't get the uh, the, the accolades that Abigail Adams gets. And she's a great mm -hmm. gal also. Mm -hmm. um, Martha burned all their private correspondence. Yes. And that's why there's not the correspondence thing to say what Martha that's advised right. uh, George to do. That's right. But um, she was a smart gal. She was capable of running the plantation when George was gone. Uh, mm -hmm. One Washington help. That's true. Mm -hmm. But Martha was a capable gal. Uh, she was dignified. She was everything good. Martha Washington spent every winter with George Washington, not in the confines of Mount Vernon, but mm -hmm. in a military camp of all mm -hmm. places. Uh, she was at Valley Forge, mm -hmm. knitting socks for the soldiers, you know, uh, talking to them. Um, she doesn't get enough press in, mm -hmm. uh, in our history. She was just a great, great gal, mm -hmm. uh, ever supportive, loved this country, loved her husband. Um, died not long after he died, I think from a broken heart. No. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. No, not long. About almost three years later. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but uh, but yeah, she was uh, quite a lady. She gets mentioned in my book, Life of Martha Washington. Um, and, and there's another one, you know, if uh, if if her husband, uh, Daniel, doesn't die, her first husband, uh, mm -hmm. she's not available for George. And that's uh, right. And mm -hmm. so, uh, you know, the other one of those things we talk about in the book a little bit is Washington's uh, being turned down for a commission in the British Army. Mm -hmm. How about that? He turned him down. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> mistake. Yeah. Big mistake. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I didn't know at the time. But mm -mm, yeah. <laughs> so anyway. Yeah. So those are my anecdotes. That's great. That's wonderful. Yeah. I was going to ask as well, when you were researching and writing, you know, you had obviously done a lot of reading on, on these men before and their lives and the world. So I wonder, did anything really surprise you? Like, oh, I didn't know that about this person. Did anything really jump out to you as something that was shocking, either in a good or bad way, as, as you were doing this project? Hmm. You know, it's interesting. Uh Something jumped out, but maybe I'm not going to answer your question. And I hate when somebody okay. doesn't answer a question. That's okay. <laughs> I'm going to say, yes, something jumped out, yes. but it wasn't one thing. Uh, okay. Yeah. Tell us everything. What jumped out at me, Alexi, was how many great Americans participated in this event. Uh, in, in my book, we have a little 800 or excuse me, 80 or 90 word vignette at the end of each chapter. Mm -hmm. And I came up with that idea because, frankly, I found too many people worth writing about, like Patrick Henry. He's just one of them. It's, it's, there's so many great uh, Americans, men and women, uh, that, that made this thing happen. And that was a surprising thing to me because, you know, growing up, you read about the, you know, the, the, the big six, mm -hmm. Washington, Jefferson, Madison, Hamilton, Franklin, Adams. I mean, everybody reads mm -hmm. about them. Mm -hmm. But Jeepers, there was so much more than them. And that was really shocking to me. And so partway through writing this book, I thought, you know what? We need to talk to people about, about guys like Governor Morris, mm -hmm. George Mason. Um, wouldn't it be interesting to know about what travel was like back then and, and what difficulties our founding fathers underwent to get to the Continental Congress uh, mm -hmm. or to go overseas and deal with King Louis? Mm -hmm. um, and so that was the biggest eye opener for me was, uh, wow, all these people helping, all pulling in the same direction. Mm. Uh, 
And unlike the French Revolution and the Russian Revolution and other revolutions, ours didn't splinter apart. You know, mm -hmm. uh, even India in the 1940s mm -hmm. splintered apart as soon as Britain was gone, right? As soon as the enemy's mm -hmm. gone, you splinter, you go in your own little camps. Mm -hmm. We had political parties, that's true, but we never splintered apart. We stayed together. And that's uh, we're the only one that I can really think of that, that did that. And uh, isn't that remarkable that we mm -hmm. stayed together? Yeah. So anyway, that was, that's my. Yeah. No, it is remarkable. And I was also thinking what, what you were saying was reminding me of something that I, I like to teach my students because it seems so unfathomable to them today to imagine that back in the colonial period, that then even in the pre-revolutionary kind of leading up to the big revolution, you know, people really grew up, lived and died in the same place. And so the cultures were so local, you know, people weren't Americans, they were Virginian, right? That's They're from exactly Massachusetts, right. right? You know, and I try to teach my students as well, like we take for granted how fast we can travel physically across this country and across the globe. Whereas back then overland travel, was super difficult. Every the best travel was over waterways, as you know, whether that's rivers or the ocean. And people who lived in Virginia might never make it to Massachusetts, right? Might never ever travel really farther than where they grew up. So when you have that in mind, and how kind of provincial everyone was, the fact that we were able to create cross-colony communication oh. to the point of banding together and winning a whole war from the major superpower in the world at the time is yeah. really remarkable. Well, it is remarkable. And, and not just the travel yeah. when you're actually on the road or in a coach or something. Yeah. But then you have to find a place to lodge. Uh -huh. And uh, it the, you know, the thing about the deplorable conditions of these wayside inns and taverns where these guys had to stay in order to go mm -hmm. to Philadelphia and sit in a hot stifling yeah. room in the middle of summer. You ever been in Philadelphia in July mm -hmm. and August? Uh, yes, I have. And I've been in that room and it is, and then I imagine, well, I'm just in a, you know, a dress. Now, what if you were in like many oh. layers of gentlemen's oh. clothing? Oh, boy. <laughs> yeah. For those viewers out there that haven't been to Philadelphia in July and August, don't do it. Just do not go wait until the fall and get up there. Our founding fathers did it for us. So. They did all the, and you know, black flies and, and all that. And so they put up with all that. Uh, they didn't get paid to do it. I mean, mm -hmm. think about that. Mm -hmm. They're doing this all on their own dime. Mm -hmm. um, you know, Robert Morris, the financier of the revolution, went broke. Yeah. Uh, financier of the revolution. Uh, people don't mm -hmm. talk about that. And uh, so many officers outfitted their own units at their dime. It's just, uh, mm -hmm. it's amazing, the sacrifice. And so... Mm -hmm. uh, uh, yeah. And so those stories have to be told as well, I think. Mm -hmm. No, that's wonderful. I agree. I think these, anytime you can tell an anecdote or a story that grasps something bigger thematically about this time period is really important, which I think actually your book does really well in its different chapters. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Okay. So if you don't mind, we're going to kind of pull out a little bit um, more about kind of your work broadly. So okay. please, if you wouldn't mind, tell us more about Americana Corner. Right. This is a website, but it's also a brand. It's a publishing house, and it's also your uh, your own intellectual output. I also noticed you said it was founded in 2020. I wonder if a pandemic had anything to do with that. Um, <laughs> so, just tell us about Americana Corner. Who who is Americana Corner for? Right, and what can we find there? Yeah, that, I'll just start with that last question. It's really yeah. for the everyday American. That's, uh, and, you know, I use that term. I don't want to use it too much uh, and trivialize it, but um, it's it's really why I do what I do. It's uh, there are so many people out there that want to know their nation's history. Mm -hmm. uh, I felt someone had to uh, to uh, address those needs. I felt like uh, there are a lot of great writers out there much better than me, that right for the, the scholarly stuff. That, that wasn't what this was going to be about. That space is occupied. Okay. But a book that was uh, that could be for the everyday American that could be put, written into their language. And I'm not talking low language. I'm not talking about that. Mm -hmm. these, these people are intelligent. Mm -hmm. But something that's interesting to them, enough detail so they learn, but not so much that they fall asleep. And, uh, and so mm -hmm. I did that. But I started Americana Corner um, 
not in, in 2020, not because <laughs> of uh, the pandemic, but because I needed a retirement gig. Oh, because, uh, I'd sold my cheese business yeah. in 2019. I had to run it for the new owners, a private equity firm for about okay. a year. Okay. And uh, I was sitting on my uh, front porch one day reading. And by about 10 o'clock in the morning, I came in and said to Shar, I got to do something else. I can't just sit out here and read all day. <laughs> and so I contacted, good Lord put me in front of Sherry Breen, who helped okay. me get this whole thing going. Okay. And then I thought, well, these stories are fun. Maybe people want to see me on video. And even if they don't, I want to see me on video. And so I'm going to do it. And Here so, we are. All right. YouTube sensation, Tom Hand. There you go. Yeah. And so we uh, we did that. And um, and that was great. But And we were reaching a nice audience. But honestly, uh, as I said before, Shar and I have been given some financial blessings from the sale of this business. We never thought the business would do as good as it did. Yeah. I'm shocked still that it did as good. And so uh, and we were never blessed with children. And so we have these these financial blessings and we need to share them uh, where we think it's important. And there's a lot of great uh, philanthropy out there for places like the Red Cross um, mm -hmm. and the, the health fields, those kind of mm -hmm. things. Um, I felt like there wasn't anybody helping smaller early American history organizations. You know, the, the big guys mm -hmm. tend to give money to the Smithsonian, mm -hmm. love the Smithsonian, great place. Mm -hmm. um, but the Red Hills of the world, uh, mm -hmm. The Packaging Institute up in Mercerburg, Pennsylvania, mm -hmm. uh, Washington Crossing, Pennsylvania, uh, Washington Crossing, New Jersey. Yeah. Uh, these are historic sites mm -hmm. that uh, they just don't get funded and mm -hmm. they have a story to tell. And so I thought, you know, that's an interesting space to fill. And so just like mm -hmm. with the cheese business, I tried to fill a space mm -hmm. um, instead of going after craft singles like everybody else was doing. <laughs> um, we filled a space and it seemed like it worked out pretty well. Yeah. I thought with Preserving America grants, we can do the same sort of thing. And so our focus is smaller grants, you know, 10,000 bucks or so. Okay. But to an organization, uh, a, a small organization, it's a lot of money. It might be the biggest grant they get. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. that's how we do that. And, uh, and where I hope to go with Americana Corner is, good Lord willing, I will take this series of books through 1876, what I call the end of America's first century, Mm -hmm. um, uh, book number two is coming out uh, this fall. I hope the manuscript's done. Uh, we're going to start piecing it together in the next couple months and then take it chronologically through uh, the end of America's first century. Um, and uh, if I have the energy and, and that sort of thing, I'd like to make sure that when I am no longer here, there's something left behind. And that's what I'm hoping for. So. That's wonderful. And in fact, you were segueing right into one of my next questions. So I don't know how much you can tell us, but is there a book number two on the horizon? Sounds like there is. There so is. It's, you, uh, it's, yeah, yeah, can it's, you tell it's, us more about it? And is it formatted well, similarly? Gonna, or just tell yeah, me what it's be a little like? secret, Alexi. Don't yeah, tell yeah. anybody. <laughs> yeah, just you and I. Okay. But it's, uh, it's on the American Revolution still. It's going to be on the three theaters uh, in the American Revolution. Oh, okay. um, north, south, and west. Great. I just finished up the uh, stories on the west, and um, okay. and uh, and so it's a uh, it's going to be a very uh, patriotic bent. You know, one of the things that I like doing is I want to make uh, my books patriotic. I want to um, I want people to be proud, mm. uh, and so uh, this book will be the same sort of thing: very upbeat, uh, very positive. Uh, you know, we can leave the criticism and the fault finding to others. I'm, I'm not going to do that. That's not my book is about. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's going to be, uh, I think it's going to be an enjoyable book, maps, pictures, all the same sort of format. Okay. Um, Sherry's crew will put together a great book for me. I'll okay. get all the credit. Ah. She does all the work. It's not fair, but that's how it is. So yeah, so. nah, you've mentioned her name a lot. I and think so that's, that's <laughs> book number two. Yeah. And then number three, since you're asking, maybe you're yes, not. Yes, I am. Three, yeah is going to be getting into finally the next set of administrations, uh, Jefferson, okay. Madison, Monroe, um, with, with once again, a focus on probably uh, three guys, uh, uh, probably going to be John Marshall, uh, James Monroe, and I haven't picked out a third yet, but um, that that early 1800s period, mm -hmm. period that we don't really know a lot about, uh, mm -hmm. great events happened then, uh, mm -hmm. and so, uh, and then from there, anyway, so I'm talking enough about the book, but so that's where we're going to go with it, I think. That's wonderful. So you feel like, or would you say you feel like you have kind of hit a passion here with this first book that 
just came out this past year, right? And you want to kind of continue this passion that you have for kind of this whole area and actually spreading it out even a little bit longer than just the revolutionary period. You know, Alexi, I tell you, I found when I retired, I found a lot of uh, my buddies, uh, you know, complaining about how, uh, you know, America's history isn't taught anymore. Kind mm. of thing. You know, I was one of those guys complaining and, I said, <laughs> you know, I'm not just going to sit here and complain. I want to actually do something about it. Yeah, okay. And so I know it's just a small book. It's just one guy doing it, but it's my little effort to uh, reverse that trend of, uh, you know, the forgetting of American history. Sure. And uh, yeah. And so it's, it's, and it's kind of fun. It gives me something to, it makes me feel like I'm doing something meaningful. Yeah, of course. Of course. Yeah. No, I mean, it's, it's a beautiful book and I think any reader would really enjoy it. It's really well written, very clear for any number of readers or any level Thank of you. interest. So yeah. definitely. Yeah. Would you mind talking a little bit more to us about maybe the kind of grant program you're running? And the reason I ask is because what you said really resonated with me as a historian when it comes to the smaller early American history yeah. institutions that are trying to keep not only keep American history alive, but also show new stories. And yeah. there's always more to learn, especially yeah. kind of on that micro level. So this semester I'm teaching here at St. Michael's a class called Public History. And my goal is just to get all my students to hop in a van every week and go to the local historical society, the local museum. There you right? go. Good for you. Yes, yeah. that's what we're doing. That's what we're doing. And I'm really that's cool. excited. That's really cool. Good. Thank you. And you know, one of the questions I'm going to have my students try to answer for themselves is, what does public history look like at, at smaller institutions, right? Because many have been to the Smithsonian's that you said, which are wonderful. Yeah. But with these smaller institutions, you know, funding can be an issue, right? Um, and they're doing, they're amazing, passionate people. And yeah. we got to get their stories out more. So tell us more about kind of what you are looking for in these smaller institutions when you are thinking about kind of your grant foundation. Yeah, we're looking for organizations that uh, obviously have a passion for history. Mm -hmm. um, they have a story to tell, uh, and it's really project oriented. It's, it's a okay. it's a philanthropic uh, phila uh, uh, philosophy that I term project phil uh, philanthropy. Mm -hmm. Project philanthropy basically does it by projects as opposed to just sending uh, ten thousand dollars to uh, uh, Stratford Hall and saying good luck mm -hmm. see you next year. It's not enough for me. We we want to be involved in what they're doing, just so, you know, so we can be versed in it as well. Mm -hmm. These smaller organizations we do the same with them. They have to give us a budget. Mm -hmm. um, everything starts with the budget. It's the business side of I me. Mean, I can't mm -hmm. avoid that. Mm -hmm. and it has to have an end game. What's the, what? How do you measure success? And so they talk about that with us. Um, and uh, it has to have a finite uh, ending period. Mm -hmm. Uh, projects can be endless, and, and that's not what this is about. You, you have to show accomplishments uh, as we go mm -hmm. along. Mm -hmm. um, the smaller organizations struggle to find organization uh, funding sources. The Ford mm -hmm. Foundation probably doesn't look at these guys. Uh, mm -hmm. Some of the, the, the other great charitable organizations, they just they're looking bigger, bigger ticket, I think. Mm -hmm. uh, and so we'll give uh, eight thousand dollars to restore a uh, an outdoor uh, kitchen. Mm, wow. or we'll fund the living history program associated mm -hmm. with it, the uniforms mm -hmm. school kids can come mm -hmm. and, uh, and watch uh, people like you and I dressed up in period garb yeah. talk about how they made bread back mm -hmm. in the day or a musket demonstration or gardening uh, you know these people are mostly mm -hmm. gardeners back then yes um, and so living history is a big part of what we do we love funding that sort of thing uh, I think about if I was a child, what would resonate with me? Some mm -hmm. guy dressed up like this with a, a sports coat on or a guy in an old floppy hat <laughs> and funny looking pants. Yeah. It's, and, and so we fund living history. Yeah, um, it's great. We love preserving things. Mm -hmm. uh, these are things that are hard, that, that need to be done, but yeah. small organizations sometimes can't find $10,000 to fix a roof. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We do that. Mm -hmm. so what don't we do? We don't buy new computers. We don't do mm -hmm. ADA ramps. We don't do uh, some of those things that are important, mm -hmm. but don't preserve history directly. Mm -hmm. um, we don't do K to 12 uh, education anymore. Mm -hmm. Not that it's not critically important. It is, 
where there's so many great organizations in that space. I'm trying to find mm -hmm. a gap to fill, to be one more fish in that pond of K to 12. I don't need to do that, but I'll, I'll go into this pond where nobody's doing anything and try to uh, fill a gap there. That's what we did at the business mm -hmm. doing in this historical business that we have. And so mm -hmm. everything with a, is with an eye towards not a commodity, not what everyone else is doing, mm -hmm. but something different that's useful. Mm -hmm. Uh, and so that's the small organizations. Um, and, uh, and I think it's resonated pretty well, to be honest with you, Alexi. We've uh, the organizations stretch coast to coast, mm -hmm. uh, helped restore a schoolhouse wow. in, in, in central California. Oh, that is coast to coast. I'm in Vermont. That's all the way in California. <laughs> yeah, we've done the World Discovery Center, also oh. in California. We've done one in Montana, a couple wow. in Oregon. Uh, and so, uh, yeah, please. Uh, and the, the window is always um, November 15th to December 15th for the applications. OK, that's great. If anybody to know. has any questions, please contact me. We'd love to talk. You know, I'm definitely going to talk about your grant opportunity uh, to what's called Whitcomb's Rangers, which is a reenactment group I've had come into my class who reenacted an American Revolutionary War encampment. There so I had some students drill with muskets last semester. Yeah. So, uh, that was maybe my favorite too. Uh, so. Outstanding. Well, that's outstanding. Good. Yeah, wonderful. Well, thank you so much, Tom. I'm going to turn it over now to our mega host, Cody. But this has been <sighs> such an enlightening talk. And I'm just really excited for more people to get their hands on your book, which is, again, called An American Triumph. And I do think it's a triumph. So thank you, Tom. Thank you, Alexi. Appreciate it. It's been a lot yeah. of fun. Yeah. All right, great. Well, thank you both for a wonderful session and thank you to our audience for attending. Uh, we're now moving on to the uh, Q&A portion. And our first question comes from uh, Lucia from LinkedIn. Uh, she says, for Mr. Hand, will Americana Corner publish any more books about the revolution, which we've already touched on? And uh, what other topics or historical moments are you interested in writing about? Well, yeah, we hope to uh, take us all the way through 1876. Uh, and um, it's, uh, the, the war of 1812 comes to mind. That's an easy one. Mexican American War, those come to mind, but, but other great seminal moments, uh, the purchase, uh, Louisiana purchase, mm -hmm. um, and the, uh, core of discovery, uh, that, uh, Thomas Jefferson had the foresight to see through, you know, it's interesting, uh, Thomas Jefferson in 1786 asked George Rogers Clark, if you'd be interested in taking a expedition West. Uh, 20 years before the, the, uh, his brother, William Clark, went west. Uh, and so we're going to talk about that. Um, uh, we're going to talk about the Missouri Compromise uh, and, uh, and so many other things. The Bank of, of the United States, uh, you know, the Hamilton's financial system, so many things that still uh, affect us today. Fantastic. Well, thank you. And our next question also comes from Lucia. Uh, what was the most challenging part of writing the book? Oh, you know, it wasn't challenging. It was fun. <laughs> this doesn't work. I mean, I read, I read great books and then I write fun stories and I find great pictures and I work with a great team. I mean, this doesn't <laughs> work. I mean, this is, and all the money, by the way, goes back into the, the grant program. So oh, uh, yeah. you know, the challenging part, you know, honestly, the challenging part, if I had to pick something is, what not to put in the book this you know this country has a history unlike anybody else's and you know what where, where do you say no like patrick henry mm -hmm. you know he could be in the book but you got to say no to some of them so i guess that's <laughs> a challenge but jeepers this was not hard this is fun well we're, we're glad to hear it and that's yeah. that's what i say too about um my work you know i consider this both my career and my hobby because i just love yeah. it so much <laughs> yeah it's really cool when that happens isn't it cody it is. Absolutely. Absolutely. All right. We've got another question here. This one's from Bonnie. Uh, did you have an interest in history when you were a child? I did. You know, it's mm -hmm. interesting. You think about what happens when you're, when you're young. My, uh, we grew up in uh, fairly modest circumstances and, uh, and so we couldn't really afford to buy much, but my mom bought me a book. I don't think I have it, uh, here to my other library, but, it was I'll call the pictorial guide to the Civil War. And I fell in love with it. Fell in love with Robert E. Lee and the Civil War generals, Ulysses S. Grant, and so forth. And uh and I couldn't get enough history after that. And um, yeah, and so it's been my thing. It's one of the reasons I went to West Point. I had read so much about the uh the fine uh, men that had gone there and I wanted to follow in their footsteps. And so uh got hooked 
I was about an eight year old on this, this cheap book from Sears and Roebuck for like 99 cents. <laughs> it's been great ever since. Well, I think that's the case for most history lovers too. It always starts when they're a child. You I agree with that. I had a Felicity American Girl doll and here I am. So. Really? Oh, so it started for you? <laughs> yes. That's great. It's a great story. <laughs> yes. All righty. Next, we've got a question from Cindy. Uh, why do you think the founding fathers are so relevant to us today? Well, they better be relevant or why bother talking about them, right? Mm -hmm. I, I, that's a great question. Uh, I, I think they are relevant. You know, uh, you can poke holes in some of the you know, things that happen. You know, slavery obviously jumps to the forefront and that kind of thing. But the reality is this. Um, we are still living off of what their work was 250 years ago. At the base of everything American is a constitution. And at the base of the, before the constitution could happen, we had to have a country of our own. And so everything they created, we're still using today. And that's the link, uh, the constitution, people find fault with it, but their relevancy goes back 250 years or comes forward 250 years to what we have today. The thought process that they put through uh, John Locke's teachings from the Enlightenment period, you know, they're all influenced by John Locke. Um, those, those central tenets of uh, individual liberty and, uh, and, and self-government, these are things that are still happening today. And we've had them so long that we take them for granted. But it all started back then. And so that constitution, the Bible of what we do as Americans is relevant today like it was back then. And that's what makes them relevant. They made it. And they did it in an era when it wasn't happening. We're the first ones to do this. We weren't getting copying other people's work. Other people copied our work. And so our founding fathers are still relevant to European nations who have embraced Western democracy. It's American democracy. We created it. And who's we? They created it, the founding mm -hmm. fathers. And so anyway, I'm probably preaching too much, but that's that's my answer. So what do you guys think about that? Well, I, I certainly agree. I think especially in today's, you know, polarized political climate, sometimes it takes us a moment to look back to our founders and think of how they worked through all these difficult discussions. Because, Tom, like you said, not everyone was on the same page. These guys were not experts. This was the first time they were doing this. And sometimes it just takes sitting down, working through your differences in order to move your country forward. What do you think, Alexi? Yeah, I think that's what amendments are for, <laughs> right? So I'm in a great, in the best way, right? I mean, the the fact that we're still living and functioning so far with um, one founding document plus a bill of rights, I think sure. is just absolutely remarkable given that so much actually has changed in in society that we're still using something that was so fundamental to kind of democracy and humanity, frankly, functioning. Yeah. So, um, but what I also like about kind of their genius with, with this founding era is that they knew society would change. Certain things they're not thinking of, we're going to come up later, or maybe they were thinking of and they want, didn't know how to solve it. So they're going to kick the can down the road, yeah. but then it has been taken up in different decades since then. And I think that is one of the lasting, like positive lasting legacies of creating a constitution and its amendability. So I think we have to really commend um, the founders for writing such a flexible document. Alexia, that is such a brilliant point. I agree. Mm -hmm. The founders made the constitution relevant to today mm -hmm. because it's amendable. It's yeah. flexible. It's, mm -hmm. it's not like it's something you can't touch. And that makes it purely relevant, doesn't it? I mean, mm -hmm. we can still touch it today. We don't have to talk about, you know, left and right calling each mm -hmm. other you don't have to do that to talk about fixing the constitution i mean that's this is a document that mm -hmm. you're right they had an eye toward the future and said you know what something's going to change let's give them the flexibility to do it they had enough faith in the american people that they do it right and uh, that makes it relevant mm -hmm. all right great well uh, i think we're going to end it here since we're coming up on the hour uh, Dr. Garrett, thank you very much. And Mr. Han, thank you both again for this wonderful presentation. Uh, and thank you to our audience for joining us. Uh, we do have these programs every month. It's our part of our Red Hill Rediscovered lectures. And uh, next February, Valentine's Day, we've got one on Patrick Henry in love. So, <laughs>
<laughs> we hope you can join us then too. And, and again, thank you to both our presenters. Thank you, Greg. Pleasure to be here. Thanks thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Cody. Thank you so much, Tom. And thank you to our audience members for joining and learning a little bit about history today. <laughs> Bye. Bye.